Hi. Hello, I can see some people are now joining us for today's BNA webinar. Welcome. We look forward to uh, sharing with you some things about the brain and nervous system today. Um, for those of you who's been to previous webinars, you might recognize myself. I'm Anne, and today we've got somebody new joining with us, uh, with us today. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, I'm Emma Weinel. I'm a neuroscientist at Cardiff University, and it's great to be joining Anne today uh, for this webinar. Um, so, <laughs> I think Emma is going to start with the first question. Yeah, absolutely. So, what is a neuroscientist is the first question. Um, so, we know that neuroscience might be quite a new concept to you. So, we want you to have a think about um, what a neuroscientist might be. So, if we can move on to that question, a poll is going to come up and it's going to give you a few answers. And there should be four answers coming up for you. So, um, is a neuroscientist the what is neuroscience? Is neuroscience the science of nectarines, the science of the brain and nervous system, science in New Zealand, or new discoveries in science? And what Kahoot does for us is it will count us down. If you're not able to answer in the time, that's absolutely fine. Don't worry about it. You can just move on to the next question. Uh, and then it will tell us what results we've got. So what people thought um, neuroscience is. Because we're talking about neuroscience a lot today. So I think it's really important that we understand what it is um, at really the beginning of our, our webinar. Okay, so we can see the results popping up here. Uh, and we had a bit of a split crowd here. So lots of people thought uh, neuroscience is the science of brain and the neurosystem. A couple of people thought neuroscience is new discoveries in science. So what we were looking for is neuroscience is the science of the brain and the nervous system. But also neuroscience is sometimes about new discoveries in science because um, we do lots of research as well. But it's really the brain and the nervous system that we were looking for there. And here's a picture of the human brain. This is a cartoon. Uh, on the left there, you can see the brain. You can see I've got this brain with me as well today. You can see it's got lots of folds on the brain. You can also see a nerve cell there on the right of the screen. And because this is a brain cell, we call this a neuron. And your brain is made up of millions of these neurons. And they're really microscopically small, but they're all in there in the brain. And we wanted to show you what these look like in real life, not just in cartoons. So here are some pictures of the real human brain. Uh, on the left there, you can see the brain, but also all of the nerves and the, the spinal cord coming out of the brain. That's what we call the nervous system because it all connects up together. So you can do things like move your legs, for example, and arms. Then you can see the human brain in, in the middle of the screen there. And so that would be a human brain that we would look at in the lab as neuroscientists. And then on the right there, you can see some of those um, brain cells, those neurons. And this image will be taken at, uh, under a microscope. So brain cells are really, really small. So we need to put our brain tissue under the microscope to be able to see them. Excellent. Thank you for that, Emma. So now we'd like to uh, ask you to use the chat box again um, that we were using right at the beginning. So if you just want to write into the chat box and we'd like you to think about the question, what do the brain and nervous system do? So what ideas have you got about what the brain and nervous system does? We've just seen some pictures of it. So the brain is in your head, your nervous system goes throughout your body. It connects all parts of your body with your brain and vice versa. Um, so have you got any ideas about what your brain and nervous system actually do? Do put them into the chat box. We've got some things coming in here. Uh, somebody says it controls your bodies. That's excellent. That's right. So your brain and nervous system controls your body, it allows it to move and it also controls things inside your body. So things you might not have thought of, like your digestive system, for instance, that's all controlled by your nervous system. Uh, someone has said thinking and decisions. Excellent answer. So yes, all your thinking goes on in your brain and the decisions you make are all based in your brain. It tells our muscles what to do and it makes decisions. So yes, absolutely. Uh, the brain thinks and commands the rest. Yes, it's excellent. Um, it tells your body what to do. 
brain sends messages to other parts of the body. Gosh, they're coming in so fast. Yeah. <laughs> it helps us to move. It helps the brain to move so don't fall on the ground. That's very important. And not only does your brain help you to move, but it keeps you balanced as well so that you don't fall over. It has the senses, exactly, yes. Yeah. So that's a really good one, isn't it? Your nervous system, you have these special senses, we call them sometimes, so vision and hearing and taste. And it also has senses that we might not think of, like proprioception. You might not have heard of proprioception. And that's the sense of knowing where your body is in space. Uh, we think it does it shut down when you are nervous. So sometimes a response to being nervous or being under stress is actually to kind of... Um, it makes you behave differently and that can be to kind of shut down. So that would be something your nervous system does as well. Let, lets you think and learn a TV. Um, I'm not quite sure what learning a TV is, but it definitely makes you think and it does make you learn as well. So I'll go with a yes for that too. <laughs> I think the brain and nervous system helps you move around and help you stay healthy. Absolutely. It has, it makes you remember and have memories. Yes. So your brain holds all your memories, both recent memories, what you've just done, but also memories of your life and what you've done last year and who your friends are and things like that. It gives us personalities. That's a nice answer. It's a different aspect of what the brain does for us. And it helps us to feel it does indeed. And it helps us to feel both touch and it helps us to feel emotions as well. So both kinds of feelings. Wow, excellent. Thank you so much for all those answers. Um, so the next one is actually, it's quite similar. So we, again, we want you to put your answers into the chat box. Um, uh, so the question we're asking you this time is what happens when they go wrong? So can you think what might happen if your brain or nervous system go wrong? So someone's already said, if you don't have a brain, you can't see and you can't hear. That's very true. So you need your brain to see and to hear. Sometimes we think of seeing as being all about the eyes, all about the ears. And that's true. You need eyes and ears, but you need your brain too. Um, you can't move. Also true. It helps us to be intelligent individuals. Yes, you're right. We need our brain to be um, to use our intelligence. You get angry, that might be true too. If your brain doesn't work properly, you can have get very angry, inappropriate emotions. Your body shuts down, unfortunately, yes. If you have a spinal cord injury, for instance, uh, you would go to hospital as you can't function. I think that, that often happens as well. You might lose your memory and you can get dementia. So two separate answers there um, with um, kind of similar things, losing men uh, your memory or getting dementia. As we said, the brain holds Oh, have we lost Dan? I think we have, so I'm just going to take over. Um, some really good things coming in on the chat there. So you're saying that you maybe can't think so much. Somebody said the Tin Man was sad when he didn't... Holds all your memories, so if that goes... Hands back. Maybe Hi, can you hear me? You're a bit intermittent, so I'll take over for a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, you can you're losing, your, losing memory as well, dementia. Um, and our brain is really important. So you've all come up with some fantastic um, things that your brain does. And because of that, we really need to look after it uh, and to keep it healthy and to keep it functioning. So a good way of looking after your brain as an example is that if you're wearing um, a helmet when you ride a bike, because that protects the head so that if you were to fall off your bike, uh, your brain would be protected. Excellent. Can you hear me again now? I can. Okay, good. That's good. Um, so there we are answering questions about when your brain goes wrong. And we also found out what happens when your internet goes wrong. So I apologize for that. Um, I think, uh, so it looks like some more coming out. I think when it goes wrong, you do not act normal. I think, um, yeah, that's also true. It can make you act very differently if your brain and nervous system go wrong. Excellent. So I think we'll move on to the next slide then. Wonderful. So I'm not sure if uh, Emma's with us, but we're asking you. <laughs> so we are going back to Kahoot for this one. And a question for you is what, what does a scientist? So you can select as many answers as you like here. What is a scientist? Is it someone who works in a laboratory? Someone who wears a white coat? Someone who is very clever? Someone who uses complicated words? So there are a few options um, for you there. So pick as many options as you like. Uh, 
in answer to the question, what is a scientist? Question. Okay, so I can see the answers have come in there and we've, we've split the crowd. You could pick lots of um, different answers there. So maybe you picked all four of them, maybe you picked just a few. And lots of people would say that scientists are all of these things. Um, they do sometimes work in laboratories. I'm a scientist and I sometimes work in a laboratory, but I also work in the clinic, helping patients, um, sometimes in the, the field. Um, people who wear white coats, so scientists do wear white coats um, sometimes in the lab. This is to protect us from any spillages of, of chemicals and things like that. We don't always wear white coats. Um, someone who is very clever. So um, science is something that is um, a discipline that we learn over time and something that we become probably experts in. Um, and then finally use complicated words. Um, so some words in science are a little bit complicated, but we do try and make it as understandable as possible. And if you are talking to a scientist and they're using really complicated words, don't be afraid to call them out on that and say, can you just explain what that means, please? Um, because that's really important for us as well. Sometimes you find that scientists kind of talk in their own language and that can be a bit of a problem sometimes. So a scientist is lots of different things and scientists come in lots of different varieties uh, and they're really just people who are investigating the world around them. So I'm a scientist and I've done science in the laboratory in neuroscience, but also working with patients who have different brain diseases and disorders to try and help them. So as a scientist, we're just investigating the world around us to really just make the world a better place. Excellent. Thank you, Emma. Um, so we are going to find out a bit more about scientists and neuroscientists as we carry on through this webinar. Um, I would like to encourage you, though, if you have any questions about neuroscience, about the brain, about the nervous system, or what it's like to be a neuroscientist, we're both neuroscientists, and so we will try and answer as many of your questions as possible. Um, please use the Q&A function for this rather than the chat. So there should be a separate Q&A box, and you can write questions into there. And um, we'll do our best to answer as many as we can can through the webinar and also towards the end when we'll be doing a bit more of an opportunity to do some um, Q&A with you. Uh, so yeah, do get your questions in there and then we will answer them as we carry on from here. So the next thing we're going to do is we're actually going to do an experiment ourselves. Um, so as Emma just explained, scientists are people who explore the world around them. And the way they do that is they do experiments and they make observations. So what do we mean by experiments and observations? Scientists do experiments and then they observe what they find from those experiments and they might make measurements and then they record what they find out. So let's have a look and try doing an experiment. So for this, you're going to need the coin that we asked you to have ready. So hopefully you have a coin ready. I've got my coin ready, Anne. Excellent, good. So. <laughs> I've got a two P piece as well. In fact, you can use any coin as long as the two sides are different. So usually it would have a head and a tail side. So grab your coin. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to do an experiment with our coin. So first of all, we need to decide what is an experiment. So let's explain what an experiment is. So there are four steps to an experiment and we've got them written up here in front of us. The first thing you need for an experiment is to have an idea about the nature of something. And a word that scientists use for an idea is hypothesis. So I don't know if you've come across that word before. It's quite a funny word. You might want to say it. Hypothesis. 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 Excellent. So that's really having an idea about the nature of something. So having, you know, do you wondering about how something works or the nature of it, what it looks like? Now, as a scientist, you don't only have an idea about it, but then you test to see if your idea is correct. So that's the really important step. Um, so you need to find a way to test your idea. So that's the second step. And then the third step is seeing what happens when you carry out your test. Um, so that is you have your test. Your test is going to help you find out whether your idea is correct. And then you need to make observations. You see what happens when you test your hypothesis. And then finally, your last step is you go back and you decide if your initial idea was correct. So there we go. We now know what an experiment is. So let's have a go at one. 
So we are going to do an experiment with our coin. Now, the first thing that we have to do is to make a hypothesis. So I want you to all make a hypothesis of how many times you think you'll get heads when you flip your coin four times. So before you start flipping your coin, I want you first to have your hypothesis or your idea and to think you might want to write it down or just to tell someone when you uh, flip your coin four times, how many times are you going to get heads? You could have it, let's think you could have it no times, you could have it once, twice, three times or all four times. So what do you think you're going to have? Make your hypothesis now. I said you could write it down or you could just tell someone or just have it in your head. So if you've done that, then we can go on to the next step. I'm going to make a hypothesis that I'm going to get three heads when I toss my coin four times. What about you, Emma? I'm going to say twice. So it's twice. four times. I think we're going to get heads twice and tails twice. That's okay. my hypothesis. Okay, excellent. So it doesn't matter what your hypothesis is, but you do have to have your hypothesis. And then we can test our hypothesis. So step two, test your hypothesis. So now we have to flip our coin four times and count the number of heads you get. So I'm going to do that. I'm not very good at flipping coins, but I'm going to have a go. Oh, so that's one, two, three, four. So I got three heads and one tail. What did you get, Emma? I got two heads and two tails. Ah, now the thing is, we've done that once, but maybe that was just a one-off. So as a scientist, we might want to do that again. So if you've done it four times over, I now want you to do it another four times and count how many times you get it, and then another four times and count the number of times you get it. So you should have three results then. So how many times you get heads when you've tossed a coin or flipped a coin four times over, and then I want you to do it three times. So I'm going to do that now. Scientists and neuroscientists, we like to repeat things because we want to be sure that our results aren't just happening because of chance, that they're happening most of the time. So repeats are something that scientists really like doing. Excellent. So I think I've got it there. I hope that you're better at flipping coins than I am. There we go. Okay, so I've got a set of results now. I can see that some of you have got results too, because I can see it coming up in the chat. So that's excellent. So flip your coin four times and then do it another two times four. So 12 times in total. And that's your experiment to test your hypothesis. So I'm going to move on to the next stage now, which is step three. So now look at what's happened. So what did you find? How many heads did you get? For me, I got uh, uh, three heads, and then two heads, and then three heads. So what did you get, Emma? I got two heads the first time, three heads the second time, and only one head the first time. Ah, okay. So I can see some things coming up in the chat. Somebody got third time three out of four, second time two out of four, somebody got two. I'd be really interested to know whether anybody got the same results every time. Mm -hmm. That would be good. Ours were all different, weren't they, Anne? Yeah, mine were all different. I got two the same, one different. It looks like, so I can see in the chat, oh, someone got three every time. Ah. <laughs> we got the same as Dr. Emma. Excellent. It's always good to do what Dr. Emma does, I think. Somebody got two and then three and then one. Excellent. So you're all being excellent scientists here. You're all doing your experiments, taking observations and then writing them down. Four out of four. Wow. The first time I got three heads, the second time I got one head and then I got four heads. So I'm really delighted that you're all carrying out your experiments here and you've got your results. So you're taking your observations. And now the final step, if you remember what step four was to go back and look and try and decide if your initial hypothesis was correct. So did you write down what your initial hypothesis was or have it in your head? Now look at your results that you got from your experiment and decide whether your initial hypothesis or your idea was correct. Um, so it all depends on if my initial hypothesis had been that I would have got three heads out of four coin flips, I would have been right on two occasions and wrong on one. So I might decide that, you know, I was probably right with my hypothesis. Um, if I just got one head on each of those times, I might decide that my hypothesis was wrong. 
Now, although we say right and wrong or correct and incorrect, the idea of experiments is that whatever you find, that is the correct thing to do is to have the observations. And then you decide whether you have, you accept that initial idea or you reject it. Um, and that tells you something about how the nature of something is happening. So that's the whole principle of experiments is that you have a hypothesis, you test it, you collect your observations, and then you decide whether that was correct or not. So hopefully you all enjoyed that. Um, I can see that lots of people are commenting on the chat, so I can see lots of different uh, answers. Um, and that just shows you that um, there's a lot of things going on that you have to take into account when doing experiments. Excellent. So this time we're going to do a neuroscience experiment. So Emma is going to talk us through this one. Yes, we are. Um, so we're neuroscientists and we like experiments that relate to the brain. This is an experiment, it's a little um, experiment or little trick really um, called the Stroop test. And all I want you to do in this test is um, when I say go, not yet, just when I say go, um, shout out the colour of the ink that the word is written in. So words are going to come up on the screen when I give Anne the go ahead um, and I want you to shout them out really loud and really proud. It won't work if you don't do that. Uh, and I want to you to just shout them out as loud as you can. So, are you ready, Anne? I am ready. Yes. Let's go. Okay. Red. Green. Blue. Oh, oh, mm, green. Oh, green. Mm, red. Oh, blue. <laughs> So this is a test that I do quite a lot. Um, this is called the Stroop test and you probably got a little bit confused there. That's absolutely normal because I played a little bit of a trick on you. I changed what the word said and the colour of the ink that the word was written in. So initially we had the word red written in the colour red. So your brain understood and it shouted out red. But then when I changed the colour of the ink that the word um, said, your brain got a little bit confused. And it probably read out what the word said rather than what colour ink the word was written in. So now you know my trick, um, let's give it another go. And we'll see whether you get any better at this when you know um, the trick and what's going to happen. So are you ready, Anne? I am ready. Let's go. Okay. Blue, red, green, green, red, blue. Aha! So maybe you got a little bit better. Tell us in the chat whether you got better the second time round or not. And this test is really quite a cool brain test because your brain has a challenge. It doesn't know what to do, whether to read the word or read the colour of the ink. So I can see that Maisie got better and Angela got better as well. Lots of people getting better, which is, is good. Um, maybe try it tonight and, and see um, what you're like then. So your brain had to inhibit your natural reaction to read that word and think, no, I'm saying the colour of the ink that the word is written in. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Emma. Um, so again, if you have got any questions at all about what we're talking about, maybe how the Stroop test works or anything at all about how your brain or your nervous system works, do put them in the Q&A and we will get um, hopefully to answer those as we go through. Um, but it's great to see that lots of you have obviously done the Stroop test and someone got them all right second time round. So congratulations. That's really good. So we're now going to do something else that neuroscientists do. Um, this is finding out what the nervous system is made of. So neuroscientists, I said neuroscientists, like other scientists, do experiments and they do particular kinds of experiments to actually find out what the brain and nerve system is made of. Now here we've got a picture. Um, this is just a model, but it's as if somebody has cut down a head um, right down through the middle. So it's kind of through their nose from front to back and you're looking sideways on and you can see inside um, somebody's head and you've got like the brain around the top, that sort of pink bit with the blood vessels in and then the spinal cord will be going down um, that kind of white line down the middle. 
So how do neuroscientists know what that's like when you cut, somebody, um, cut somebody's head like that? Um, so they've been doing experiments um, for quite a long time now. And these um, are kind of anatomy experiments or experiments in dissection. So dissection is really finding out what things are made of and how they can fit together and what, um, what they do in relation to other parts of the body. Uh, now here on your screen, you can see these are two drawings made a long, long time ago by very early neuroscientists. Um, the one on the left is by someone called Leonardo da Vinci, who you may have heard of. Um, he's very famous both scientist and artist. And you can see here that he's been observing um, what the head is made of and the brain, and he's got some pictures of it there. And then the one on the right is by another early neuroscientist called Vesalius, and he's got both the brain and the nervous system, and he's dissected that out. Um, so by doing these kind of dissection experiments, neuroscientists can find out what the brain and nervous system is made of. Now, unfortunately, we can't actually do a dissection of the nervous system with you today um, because they're quite hard <laughs> to find and I don't think you'll have one at home. But we are going to do a dissection experiment now to kind of work through the steps that you might do if you were trying to find out what something was made of. So at this point, I think if you've got something uh, that you can take apart. Um, so if I just put the next slide up, there's um, what uh, these things might be. Oh, I should explain what our dissection experiment is going to do. So the idea, if you remember, we have four steps of our experiment like we did before. With our dissection experiment, our idea or hypothesis is going to be that whatever we're cutting up or taking apart is going to be made of the same stuff all the way through. So whatever we see on the outside before we cut it up, that's going to be the same all the way through. We're going to test this idea or hypothesis by cutting it up into pieces or just taking it apart. And then we're going to observe from our test whether it is made of the same stuff or not. And then based on our test, on our experiment, we'll decide if our initial idea was correct. And that is whether it's made of the same stuff all the way through. So let's see, how are we going to do our dissection experiment? So hopefully you've got something that's relatively easy to take apart. It might be um, something, a uh, kind of food item. We've got quite a lot of different foods up here. It might be something like Play-Doh or plasticine. Um, but whatever you have, if you want to uh, pick that up now, um, and then you can use just like a normal table knife. I've got one here. Or you can use just your fingers or a spoon. Um, if you have got, if you are quite young and you might want to get someone to help you with this bit, um, just to do the kind of the cutting bit, but you don't need a sharp knife, just a normal knife is fine. So I know what you've found in the chat. I'm gonna let Anne know that your video is kind of buffering. Um, we can hear you fine, but your video is buffering. So if you do the dissection, we might not be able to see it. So I'll just do one. That's fine, there's technology. Okay. It's roll sometimes. Um, and okay. I've got this green apple. So I can see that um, Maria's got a red apple. Um, we've got an onion there. I've got an apple like this. And my hypothesis or my idea is going to be that this apple is made of the same stuff all the way through. So think about what your hypothesis is. Um, I've got this apple, someone's got kinetic sand, which is quite cool. Ooh, that's right. um, and because I've got this apple, I'm just going to chop into it. So from the outside, we can see that our apple has a nice green skin here. But if we weren't going to chop into it, we would never know what was in the middle. We just wouldn't know. So to do that, we're going to chop into it. So I am just going to chop in to this and um, through the apple and see what's behind it, what's underneath the skin of the apple. Fantastic. Easier said than done. <laughs> what have you got on there? We won't be able to see it. Talk us through it. Yeah, I said I don't know if my video is working, but um, I will describe what I've got in front of me and I will hold it up in case you can see. So I have got a samosa, which from the outside just looks like it's kind of pastry, I guess. It's all the same colour and texture. And I've also got a pack of butter. So on the outside, my butter looks like you'd expect butter to look. It's kind of pale yellow colour. Um, and it's a, a block, a rectangular shape. And um, I am going to cut both of those up to see if they are made of the same stuff all the way through. So What's excellent. your hypothesis, Anne? Oh, I, my hypothesis is that it is made of the same stuff all the way through. So that's the hypothesis I'm testing. Cool. 
Thank you for correcting me, Emma. No, 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 that's okay. We need our hypotheses. Absolutely. So I hope you're all doing that now. I can, I've got some discoveries already. So what are you finding out? I can see some comments coming up. Somebody said, I cut through plasticine with a 50 pence coin. I think that's great initiative there. Mm -hmm. Using a coin from your earlier experiment to now cut through in your dissection experiment. I think that's fantastic. Somebody was right, so they had their hypothesis and they tested it. And obviously they accepted their hypothesis that the Play-Doh was the same all the way through. Excellent. Okay, so you found out that your Play-Doh looked the same all the way through and there was no other things going on inside it. Wonderful. So I wonder, so hopefully you've all started kind of, you know, cutting into your things and breaking them apart and seeing what, they, uh, what they're inside your objects, your apples and your onions. Someone said there are seeds and juice. So that's got different things inside it, hasn't it? Someone cut an egg right through. Someone was correct, yay. So obviously that matched their initial hypothesis. So we've got another little quiz for you on Kahoot now, which is based on what you've just done. Um, so if you want to now look on Kahoot, if you have your experiment done and your observations of what um, your objects are, we want you to, um, put some answers in the next Kahoot question. So on this one, you can choose as many things as you want. And what we're gonna ask you is, is it made of the same thing all the way through? Does it have more than one color? Is it fluffy inside? Or is it wet to touch? You can um, select as many of those that apply to whatever it is that you're cutting up. So, if it's uh, made of the same thing all the way through, if it has more than one colour, if it's fluffy inside, and if it's wet to touch. So I can see the answers coming in now. It all depends, of course, on what your object is. So it's going to be different for everybody, but we'd, we'd just love to see um, what you found out from your object. Yeah, and I can see here that my experiment with my apple had a bit of a, a taste of my apple that's a good thing about using an apple for this you can have a little tasty snack um my apple on the outside you could see it had this green skin but on the inside you can see the flesh of the apple there and when i cut in again a bit further you could see the core of the apple and the seeds within it and we wouldn't have known that this apple had seeds if we hadn't cut into it and that's why dissections are important so that you can see inside things but just while you're um, filling in your final poll, poll results, just wanted to talk to you about this egg. So I've got this egg as well. And because this is a neuroscience seminar, an egg is a really good um, model for the brain because it's got a hard outer shell, which can represent our skull. And then within the egg, um, you can see the white of the egg in there, which we could think represents our brain. And we can do dissection on the brain, but we can also do some quite cool stuff on brain imaging, where we can put people in a scanner and see what's going on inside their brain. And um, so that's quite cool as well. Wonderful. So I can see lots of um, comments coming up in the chat, but let's have a look at the poll results first. So seven of you would replied that it is made of the same thing all the way through. So maybe that was a bit like my butter. So when I cut into the butter, it looked the same all the way through as it did on the outside. So if our initial hypothesis was that it was made of all this, the same thing all the way through, you confirmed that hypothesis, you accepted it. 15 of you, however, said it had more than one color. Three of you said it was fluffy inside. So I'd love to know what you're cutting up. Um, and nine of you said it is wet to touch. So that's really interesting, isn't it? Because we've not only kind of answered our initial hypothesis. So our initial hypothesis was just whether it was made of the same thing. But by doing observations as well, we've also found out other things like it has more than one color or it's fluffy inside or it's wet to touch. So those are things that um, scientists do as well as experiments. They also make observations. And those additional observations can sometimes raise more questions. So experiments answer questions, they answer that original question, but then they ask more questions because now that you've found out that your object has more than one color, let's say that it was a cucumber, because I can see someone in the chat said their cucumber was dark green, but when they cut into it, it had seeds and was light green. So there are two different colors there. 
but that does that mean that all cucumbers are made of more than one color? Does that mean that all vegetables have more than one color? So you can see that there's another question that's been raised by that initial experiment. So that's what scientists and neuroscientists are doing all the time, is actually asking themselves questions, testing it, finding out the results, and then finding more questions because of the experiment they've done. So I hope that was quite fun. I hope you've got something nice to eat maybe at the end of that. Um, there's some great answers in the, in the chat here. There's a lovely one here, um, which says, my Play-Doh was the same all the way through, although my dad said there was a banana in it. So I think the dad might have been pulling your leg a bit there, wasn't he? Um, you, um, <laughs> you hadn't done that dissection. Yeah, you wouldn't have known. You might have been right. So excellent. Um, I think that's uh, an excellent uh, experiment that you've all done. Well done. So if we move on to our next slide then. You can see that Marthy had a hedgehog cupcake, which sounds quite fun, isn't it? <laughs> right, so our next question, we're going over to Kahoot again, aren't we? Anne? Yes, we are. Um, and the next question for you is, can anyone be a neuroscientist? And is that true or false, do you think? So can anybody be a neuroscientist? True or false? What do we think? Ah. Aha. So 15 of you thought that was true, which I'm really pleased about because I think Anybody can, can be a neuroscientist and yes, you have to study hard um, and get a degree and things like that. But I think anybody can be a neuroscientist if they're interested in the subject and they're keen to learn more about it. What do you think, Anne? I think that's definitely true. I think anybody can be a neuroscientist. If you're interested in the brain and the nervous system, then you should be a neuroscientist because then you get to spend all the time finding out about the brain and nervous system. Um, so yes, absolutely, anybody can be a neuroscientist. So we're going to have another activity now. Um, now this is an activity that we are going to start now together, but you can carry on after the webinar as well if you want to carry on working on it. Um, but whilst we're doing this activity, uh, we're also going to be answering some Q&A. So don't forget to put some questions in the Q&A that we can answer for you. I can see some have gone in there, which we'll be answering it. Um, now this activity, so you can get out your drawing things um, because now we would like to ask you to draw yourself as a neuroscientist. So anybody can be a neuroscientist. We've learned something about what scientists do and we'd love to see drawings of yourself as a neuroscientist. Um, so if you want to get your drawing things, your paper, your pens, your pencils um, and get creating and we shall answer some questions while you start on that. Uh, there's a lovely question for Emma here, which I think we should start with. So what's your cuddly brain called, Emma? Well, yeah, it's a good question, Anne. It's a question I get asked quite a lot. Um, Brian is the answer. Brian, yeah. nice name. Why Brian? Because he's a brain. And I like the <laughs> with a name. Brian the brain. Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me too. Right. So why did you want to be a scientist? And what's your favourite thing about being a scientist? So I'm going to answer that first. And then I'm going to ask Emma to reply as well, because I suspect our answers will be slightly different. Um, I wanted to be a scientist because I was just really interested in how things worked. Um, I always wanted to kind of take things apart and find out what put them together and how things um, kind of happened, in particular in the body and in living things. So I started off doing biology and then I specialised in neuroscience because I became really interested in how the brain worked. So I wanted to know how things worked, but then I was also interested in finding out really what happened when it went wrong so that we could help to cure people. And although I know that I it only played a very, very small part in that understanding. I really wanted to help the understanding of what went wrong when the nervous system went wrong and then to help people who had a particular condition called motor neuron disease. Um, my favorite thing about being a scientist, I really loved doing work in the lab. So I loved, I used microscopes quite a lot. I loved looking down the <laughs> microscope and seeing real nerve cells and real neurons and they're just amazing to see. They're just these really complex bits of machinery um, that are beautiful and how they work is it's just um, a phenomenon. So that's what I really enjoyed. How about you, Emma? Yeah, so 
I wanted to become a scientist because at school I really liked biology. I think I was a bit like you and I really like living things. Um, and I was really interested in what makes us us when you put us under a microscope. Um, so the molecules that, that make us as people. Um, so that's why I like doing science. And I think the best thing about doing science for me and the reason I really like doing it and I like teaching people about it is because it helps people. So I've worked with lots of people who have different brain diseases and disorders uh, and the science is really about helping them and doing what we can to make their lives um, better and make people, be people better in the future as well. Wonderful, thank you Emma. Um, so we might have kind of partly answered this one but do you like being a scientist? I do, I really like being a scientist. Um, in my job I don't actually work in a lab anymore, um, I work in as a kind of in a different part of doing science um, but I do, I really uh, love doing science. I'm really glad that I decided to be a neuroscientist and yes, I like being a scientist. How about you, Emma? Yeah, I like being a scientist too. Um, I've been a scientist for quite a while now. Um, but yes, I do like it. I think with any job that you have, there will be um, times when you like it and times where you maybe don't like it so much. But I really like um, being a scientist and telling other people about it. And just to say, if you haven't spotted the Q&A section, that is just in the middle of your screen at the bottom, slightly different from the chat box, um, just in case you haven't found it yet. Excellent. Uh, so, gosh, lots of questions coming in now. What oh, <laughs> How does it feel like in an MRI scanner? Um, so I have been in an MRI scanner. Um, I think it, it does vary a bit depending on um, uh, the type of scanner, exactly the type and what you're there for. So maybe my experience isn't exactly the same as everyone else. Um, but it's quite strange experience because you're, for those who don't know, an MRI scanner is a type of kind of taking photographs of the brain. It's quite a big object and you go right inside it. So it's like a kind of tube that you go into if you can imagine like a really big toilet roll and you sort of go into the middle of it um, and then the MRI scanner is quite noisy it's quite a noisy machine so you're usually wearing um, like headphones or something to block out the noise and because you can't see anything except the inside of the MRI scanner it's quite disorienting because you can't see the world around you um, but it's quite comfortable you're lying down nothing really sort of happens nothing is poking into you or anything like that so and you're just lying there and sometimes you do things if people ask you to do things or think about things um uh and then you come out again and and that's what it is really um so i don't know if you've had an mri um but that's that's what it's like having an mri scan yeah and mri stands for magnetic resonance imaging in case you're wondering what it means and because it uses lots of magnets within the scanner it can be quite noisy as well so when people um go in the mri scanner we'll give them headphones um to just stop the noise getting into their ears um, it, it might be as well that because they're using magnets, um, you before you go into the room with the MRI scanner, we need to check that there's no metal uh, on you or in the body either, because the magnet will attract the metal in the scanning room as well. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a question here, what is your least favourite thing about being a neuroscientist? So I guess that follows on from our favourite things. Gosh. Um, uh. <laughs> well, I think for me, yeah. <laughs> probably one of my least favourite things is when experiments don't turn out the way you wanted. And that's really frustrating and maybe a bit annoying, but it's part of science. Um, sometimes things don't turn out the way you expect. So you make a hypothesis and that's incorrect. And that's a bit frustrating, but that's what happens. That is science. And it's really important that we are honest and, and if it hasn't worked we just say it's not worked our hypothesis has been proven to be incorrect and um, so that could be quite frustrating if you've done an experiment that takes two years um, but that's that's just the way it goes and that's really important in science and um, that we either prove or disprove our, our hypotheses. So I'm just going to jump down a bit, a question that's been um, sitting there a little while. Uh, what happens if you hurt your brain? Um, so that's a really good question and people do hurt their brain sadly and it can be hurt through injury if you hit your head 
or it can be hurt through disease if there's a disease process. And what happens really depends a lot on whereabouts in the brain this injury happens. Because your brain does all those things that we talked about earlier. It helps us to move, it helps us to see and to hear, to think, to speak, to have personality, to feel emotions. All these things happen in the brain. So depending where exactly that injury is, then that will dictate what effect it has. Um, now, some types of brain injury you can recover from. Uh, it might take a little while, but you do recover. And other types of brain injury, it's very hard to recover or you only get some recovery from it. Um, so types of brain injury might include, I said, like if you actually hit your head, but it could also be a disease like maybe um, dementia. You might know some people with dementia um, or another kind of degenerative disease. Um, but I hope that, hope that answers your question of what happens if you hurt your brain. So do you want to answer one, Emma? Yeah, sure. Um, so how long does it take to become a neuroscientist? That's a really good question. Um, so I suppose it depends where you start off from. So in, in school, um, to be a neuroscientist, it's really about science. So I did some GCSEs in science and some A-levels. Um, and, and just the GCSEs and, and A-levels took about three years. Uh, and then I went to university to do a science degree. We call that an undergraduate degree. Uh, and you can do those in, in neuroscience. I actually didn't do a degree in neuroscience. I did a degree in a different type of science called biochemistry. And then I went on and did a PhD. So that's a, another degree in neuroscience. So that's why um, I can call myself Dr. Emma because I've got a PhD in neuroscience. So all in all, I would say, what do you think, Anne? Probably about maybe three years for GCSEs and A levels, maybe four, three for a degree, maybe three or four for a PhD. So probably about 10 to 12 years. And I think it's also really important that, you know, I'm still learning stuff every day. And um, we're still always learning when we're, we're scientists and we're discovering new things. Mm -hmm. So that never really stops either. I've just seen a few comments in the about uh, in the chat about MRI scanners and somebody has been an MRI scanner. So that's really interesting. Uh, somebody tried MRI, but it was really noisy. And that is true. MRI machines can be noisy um, or they are noisy because of how they work. Um, so they can be quite scary, but they don't actually hurt you at all. Um, so uh, there's a question here. Um, what does it feel like being a neuroscientist? So that's an interesting question. What does it feel like? Um, it's quite exciting sometimes. I think there is an excitement about doing things which nobody has ever done before um, and finding out things that people didn't know before. As Emma said, it doesn't always work. It doesn't work out how you want it. Um, so although it's exciting, it can also be quite frustrating um, and it can feel like it's being really slow. So the work you're doing is, is really slow. Um, it also feels like a real privilege. So I think it, I feel very privileged to have had the opportunity to learn about neuroscience and to have the chance of practicing neuroscience. Um, so yeah, a kind of mixture of things. Yeah. So I, I can see Maisie's asked us, um, how do you become a scientist in Wales? Um, I love questions that relate to Wales because I'm in Cardiff. Um, but neuroscience is, is really pretty similar um, across the whole of the UK across Europe and to some extent the whole world. Um, so it's really about studying neuroscience, whether that's um, at A level or in a degree or in a PhD, it's really just about studying science um, and studying science that you're interested in as well, because if you're interested in it, that makes it a whole lot easier. Uh, there's a fantastic question here. Have you ever held a brain? And I have. I've held um, quite a few brains, I guess. Um, I've held uh, human brains um, and I've seen a lot of human brains because I have visited um, the brain bank. So a brain bank is where people actually donate their brain after they have died to allow neuroscientists to study them. So this is an amazing gift that people give to neuroscience is they actually give their brain to be studied after they have died. 
um, and those brains are kept together in what's called a brain bank um, and there you can see lots of brains and um, scientists study them and find out you know how they work and what they've what's gone wrong if they've had a disease and really help people um, to have better treatments in future um, a, a kind of fresh brain is quite it's very soft it hasn't got much kind of its own structure to it it's really held together by the skull um, and the fluid around it. And then if you take it out, it's really soft and sort of collapses. Um, but quite often um, brains are preserved so that people can carry on studying them over quite a long time. And then they take on a slightly different sort of structure and texture um, and a slightly different color as well. Um, so yes, I have held a brain. <laughs> yeah, and when they're preserved, it's really just like pickling something um, so that it lasts for longer so that we can more people can use it and can benefit from it so that's as Anne said that's a really special um, gift that some people choose um, to donate their brains to science and that's really amazing so that we can learn from them mm -hmm. absolutely um, I can see a question of was it hard to be a neuroscientist um, coming in there so yes I think um, it has been hard to be a neuroscientist but I think it's hard sometimes in lots of different things uh, and just because something's hard sometimes the things that you manage to do that are the hardest are the best um, so just because something's easy don't don't just do stuff because it's easy and um, the hard stuff is really great to do too. Excellent. Um, what is the most well-known study of neuroscientists? Um, I'm not quite sure if I've interpreted this question correctly, but I'm going to take it as what's the, the best known kind of discovery of neuroscientists. And I'm going to go a long way back now to one person who maybe is one of the first neuroscientists. And this is someone who was a doctor to Romans. So back in Roman times, so at least 2000 years ago, um, I, you might have heard about Roman uh, gladiators. So there would be battles and fights between um, gladiators with swords and other weapons. So they had you know, really dreadful injuries sometimes. And there was a doctor who would um, try and treat the injured gladiators. And he was the one who first noticed that if the spinal cord was damaged, so that is the nerve that goes down your back in the spine, then it would stop the limbs from moving. So if you have a damage in your spinal cord, then you might not be able to move your arms and your legs. And he was the first person who really kind of made that connection between how um, the brain is connected to the rest of the body and controls the rest of the body. So I think that's just, you know, that's a really well known and very important study that's been done in neuroscience. There are lots of others out there, of course. Yes, I'm going to pick up on this um, question of, of do you stress, um, just to, to pick up on that one. So yeah, sometimes I think lots of jobs can be stressful. Um, but on the whole, I, I have um, a good job and there, there are much um, more good points than the stressful points. I'm going to jump around a bit and see if we can just finish off a few more before we get to the end of the hour. Um, mm. A really quick one. Has any of your family members been a neuroscientist? No, I was the first person in my family to be a scientist of any nature, in fact. Um, and I still am. <laughs> so I still get asked lots of questions about science. Uh, is there anything living that doesn't have a brain? Well, uh, plants are living, of course, and plants don't have brains. Uh, they don't have a nervous system, although they do have a way of communicating kind of within themselves. So plants don't have brains. Um, very small organisms like bacteria don't have brains. I suspect you might be thinking of slightly larger things. Um, there are some larger things that don't really have a brain as such, but they have collections of neurons and they might be called dispersed ganglia. Ganglia means a collection of neurons. Um, but an awful lot of animals have brains, more than you might think. Uh, bumblebees have brains, for instance. Um, flies have brains. So yeah, there's a lot of different types of brains out there. So I hope that answers your question. I'm just gonna pick up on this, this question and then we'll probably have to round it out because we're looking at the time. Um, what's different about your work in lockdown? Quite a topical question. Um, so yeah, quite a lot because lots of universities have shut, um, which means that we are working from home and working remotely. So quite different in lockdown. Very different, yeah. 
So I think we're going to have to wind up then. I really loved answering your questions. So thank you for such great questions. Um, so let's just recap what we have learned today. And I hope that you're getting on well with your draw yourself as a neuroscientist little um, task as well. I, I'd love you to, to share those with us um, if you'd like to afterwards, either through email or social media. Excellent. So, so looking at what we've learned um, now over the, the hours um, webinar, so we know that neuroscience is a study of the brain and also the nervous system. We know that scientists are people who explore the world around them and they use experiments to test ideas or hypotheses. That's a good word that you should have learned from this webinar. And neuroscientists use experiments to find out how the brain and nervous system work and are put together. And experiments can reveal new observations too. So scientists are always learning um, lots of different things. Excellent. So I'd just like to say a big thank you for joining us today. Um, we always love talking about the brain and nervous system and love your questions. If you haven't had one of your questions answered during the webinar, I'm sorry we haven't had time to um, answer them, but you can always email them to us. I've got my email address up there. We'd also, as Emma said, we'd love to see any pictures that you have drawn or any pictures of the things that you've cut up. Um, and to send them to us. If you're happy for us to put those on our website, we've got a little gallery of pictures or on our social media. It'd be great if you can let us know. Um, if you don't want to, that's totally fine as well, of course. Um, just encourage you, if you are interested in neuroscience, then do check out the British Neuroscience Association if you're interested in becoming a neuroscientist, or you can even join. As, as soon as you're 16, you can actually become a member of the British Neuroscience Association.